So I just wanted to take you through a case here. This is a child that was just uh, had surgery about a little over a month ago for, for her hydrocephalus, but she initially presented two years ago with headaches, nausea and vomiting and neck pain. Her parents took her to a local hospital, but by the time she was imaged and transferred to our facility, she was lethargic with bradycardia. Um, and a colleague of mine took her to surgery for a placement of an external ventricular drain. She woke up immediately and felt a whole lot better. Her exam only was notable for papilledema. She had normal motor findings, no other cranial neuropathy. Um, so she could you can see here, she had this uh, posture of this large salamic mass that was obstructing the aqueduct. Um, we eventually performed an occipital transcentorial approach and subtotally resected the lesion. Yep, most of it out, but not all of it. And it was a, unfortunately a, a H3K27M high grade diffuse midline glioma. And uh, she's battled that for the last few years with ra radi radiation, chemotherapy, and a few different clinical trials. But she returned recently with headaches and vomiting. And this is the progression from January to March until now in May. And, and she was having a, a frequent headaches and vomiting. And you can see that that, that Here's the picture here on the T1 on the right. There's this, the tumor is growing back and it's now obstructing the, the, the cerebral aqueduct. So we recommended um, an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Her oncologist wanted additional tissue like they always do. So we also were able to use a flexible scope to biopsy some of the uh, tumor for additional material. But the primary goal of surgery, the first thing that we did was the third ventriculostomy to deal with her hydrocephalus. And, it's going to take you through this. So this is how, again, after the setup that I described, um, this is a right frontal approach here. And the resident's going to make the burr hole here in a second. And then once, once the dura is coagulated and open, um, this is the stylet here from this navigation system uh, in the PLOA sheath. And you can see this video here, we're tracking real time through the, through the, vent, through the brain into the ventricle to get us into the... Uh, the horn the right way the first time. So that's, that's, you know, see a little drop of CSF starting to come out. We're just barely in the ventricle here. Um, so that's, that's how it starts. The, the obturator is removed, the PLA sheath is open a little bit, and then the scope is in, introduced. Sorry, scope is introduced. And this is kind of what we saw immediately. So again, we want to make sure that we're on the correct side. She's got a very large thalamus dried vein, Cori plexus, frame of Monroe, the septal vein is really diminutive. We didn't really see it very well, but um, it's just not not really there. But but we knew we were on the correct side, and you can see here that we're going to enter the the third ventricle here in a second. And really, it's apparent very quickly. You can see the mammillary bodies right here as we get things stabilized. Here's the floor, the tuber scenarium, infundibular recess, that pink color right here optic chiasm, the suprachiasmic reflex. And here's, we're just looking back posteriorly to get a look at the, the tumor there that will biopsy in a few minutes. But this was just a quick look back there to see what it, what it looked like. So this was a flexible scope, which we can take a look back. This can also be done with a rigid scope, but again, it can be difficult um, depending on, on the, where your burr hole is. And some, some surgeons have actually uh, used two burr holes to do that, two different trajectories to biopsy and also do the ETV. So the flexible scope gives you some added options there. Again, here's the, here's the tuber scan. There's the probe coming down, the blunt probe, the grasping forcep. And you'll see a pop, actually. You can usually feel that, but you'll see it too, that kind of floor shudders. A little bit of smoke there, just a small bit of blood from the surface, but that's really not much to worry about. That'll oftentimes stop with irrigation, which is kind of running slowly in the background. And then, um, sometimes if it's really going, you may have to use the cautery for that, but it's pretty infrequent to do that, or even tamping on that with the, with the embolectomy balloon. Here's the balloon coming down, so you can see it pops through the uh, floor, and we're just going to dilate this up here in one second, and, uh, and then lower the balloon again before we remove it. And there's a nice opening in the floor, but there's another membrane here that we got to deal with. So this is the membrane a little bit closer. You can see that in the way there. I think without, I mean, there's some smaller openings, but we generally recommend opening that as well. So I use the Bugley wire without power. This is a card, electric cautery wire, but it's a little stiffer than the, than the balloon and just made another opening, which we further dilated just to ensure that we had really a, a nice free opening to the prepontine cistern, as you'll see here in a second. And that's the, the ultimate view there, the, the prepontine cistern with the basal artery pumping away the colivus here. And you can see the Neurovascular structures off to the side. So here's the surface of the ponds right here. 
And then when we're done here, I don't show the biopsy, but we kind of take a quick look when we're finished with the irrigation off. And you can see the floor kind of pulsating nicely back and forth with the cardiac cycle. This gives you a good idea. So that's generally a good sign that things will, will work. Um, so most of these children will go home you know, post-op day one or two. Um, she did very well, was discharged the next day. Her headaches and vomiting resolved very quickly. And this was four weeks later. So you can see there has been a considerable reduction in the size of her ventricles, which correlates with her improved symptoms. Unfortunately, she still has a, a battle ahead of her with her tumor, but her hydrocephalus for right now is, is not a part of that. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.